Okay, everybody, this is the last of our afternoon sessions here, another 15-minute uh, quick talk. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Medora Pashmakova. Uh, Dr. Pashmakova earned her DVM from Michigan State University and uh, completed an internship and residency at Texas A&M in critical care and is currently at a uh, specialty practice in Houston. So please welcome Dr. Pashmakova. Dr. Fogel, can you guys hear me pretty well in the back? Sometimes I have to be turned up. Okay, great. Um, so real quick, we're gonna talk about um, chest tubes and, and really more so specifically about uh, low profile drainage catheters. Sometimes I try to stay away from the term chest tubes because it's a much kinder and friendlier and easier thing to use. So I'm gonna show you some videos and pictures um, and I'm actually gonna show you a video of me placing one of these in and uh, talk you through how it, how it works. They're, they're really um, wonderful devices. I don't, by the way, have any financial affiliation with either of the two companies that make the majority of these, Myla and Infinity Medical, but they do make really great products and I'm gonna talk about them today. So on this particular picture, I've actually cheated a little bit. This is a um, pigtail catheter that is actually indwelling into the gallbladder. It's just close enough to the chest that I made it for the front slide. But uh, this goes to show you that these indwelling catheters can be useful not just in the chest, they can be useful in the gallbladder um, with, of course, being very careful. Um, also in the urinary bladder in animals that are difficult to unobstruct. So they do have a lot of different indications and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those peripherally as well. But, if we're talking about the chest specifically, we're talking about the major indications being a pet that requires recurrent thoracocentesis for an ongoing pleural space disease process that needs evacuation, right? So that's gonna be mostly any kind of um, pneumothorax that is continuing and ongoing. So a traumatic pneumothorax would be a really good, good one to think about. Um, and then any kind of ongoing pleural effusion that you need to continue to suction over and over again. Once I've decompressed a, a thorax once or twice and centesed them and they keep needing it over and over again, I talk to my owners about going ahead and putting in a low profile drainage catheter so I don't have to keep sticking needles into this animal's chest over and over again. And instead I can use something much nicer. I'm gonna first though take a step back and remind all of us of what chest tubes actually look like. You guys are all familiar with these, right? At some point, hopefully you've run into these, either it was in vet school or, or sometime since, um, or if you work in a practice where these are used, these were pretty barbaric, maybe is not exactly the word I'm looking for, but these are really massive instruments that tend to require a lot of brute force and actual manual force to, um, to put in. They used to joke and say you need to take a fossum surgical text and actually slam it on top of this to get it into the chest. And it's not, not much of a joke, actually. It's not quite far from the truth. So I'm gonna show you a video of an anesthetized German shepherd in right lateral recumbency who's getting a chest tube placed. These original sort of big bore chest tubes, the actual ones, and show you how that compares to what we have access to these days. So this is just to show you the amount of force it takes to pop through the chest and actually get this tube into the thorax. And it's not you know, something that can't be done. These animals do have to be generally anesthetized for this. Um, I would say that with some of the more flocculent effusions like a pyothorax, like what this dog I think had, um, it is a better alternative sometimes than the low profile ones that can get a little bit obstructed, but it is kind of a big deal. They should be anesthetized for this. Um, and then you do have to use some brute force to actually get it in. And that's one of my residents doing that actually just uh, I think it was a couple of years ago. So pretty standard placement of a chest tube. Um, and then of course getting air out after that. So there we are. Um, in contrast, I think we have some kinder options and some more low profile ways that we can insert drainage devices into the chest and other places that don't require that kind of significant effort. Um, and there are two companies that actually make really, in, and I think they're both in the exhibit hall, but sh uh, for sure Myla is, because I actually talked to them today. Myla International does um, pigtail catheters. They also do the low profile chest tubes that I'm gonna show you and demonstrate in this lecture. And Infinity Medical does a lot of these pigtail drainage catheters as well. And what they are, are essentially, for the pigtail catheters, they're fenestrated 
uh, polypropylene catheters that are inserted in a three-way, um, in a sort of a triplicate. There's, a, there's an inside trocar surrounded by a stylet surrounded by the ultimate catheter. And I'll show you kind of how that works. And the only thing left in the animal at the end is the catheter itself and everything else in metallic is removed from them. So they're uh, great and I've used them in, like I said, gallbladders, urinary bladders, and of course the chest as well. So this is a gallbladder. That was actually the first picture that I showed you today. And this was a, uh, this was a male dog that actually had a really um, difficult urethral stricture from a urinary injury. He had tried to jump over a fence and actually cut himself right across the urethra. You can see the, the old scar right there. And as he healed, he actually also strictured down his urethra. And I couldn't, unblo I couldn't pass a catheter. I couldn't actually pass a catheter when he represented to me for the actual stricture. So I had to go ahead and do a percutaneous drainage of the bladder and end up using a pigtail catheter until we could figure out some other options for his urethra. So that's another place that you guys can use these. And one of my colleagues actually created this really uh, nice video that demonstrates exactly how these pigtail catheters work. So if this was the bladder in that particular dog, you would insert the, um, the infinity pigtail catheter, which is straightened out in its original version with the trocar in the middle, the stylet on the outside, and the catheter on the very outside of that. And you would insert that towards the trigone, so between the middle and the trigone of the bladder, not the apex, all right? Because as you deflate the bladder, it's gonna slip away from you otherwise. You remove the trocar and the stylet, and you leave the pigtail in place, and all of the fenestrations of that pigtail remain within the lumen of whatever you're trying to drain, in this case, the bladder. And, you can, and it's a lure lock at the end, so you can attach this to a lure lock drainage system, and then percutaneously make sure that you still secure the catheter to the skin, all right? So those are really crafty. I've used them in cats and dogs, and once in a ferret, because I cannot unblock ferrets, and they seem to have this problem as well. Myla has a very nice device, um, which is actually using the, um, using the uh, Seldinger technique, essentially a guide wire based introduction of a low profile chest tube. And this is all the supplies that you get in the kit. So the, this comes in a kit, you peel it off and you've got everything right in there. And what this is, is you've got the actual catheter. You've got some kind of uh, fenestrated drape if you would like to use that. You've got a soft J-tipped wire, which we're gonna talk about how that's used, several lure lock adapters to close things off. You've got a scalpel blade, um, you've got a introducer um, and a dilator, and you've got sort of a securing devices which are gonna eventually secure the tube to the skin. Same thing for central lines in the jugular as this is. It's a very similar thought process, a very similar insertion and procedure. And I actually have this picture from a cat that I saw literally two weeks ago for chylothorax. So I used bilateral myla drainage tubes in a chylothorax cat, which was really helpful because that cat needed to be current evacuation multiple times per day. And that way I can put it on my treatment sheet that every six hours my technicians actually will suction the chest and we can quantify exactly how much we're getting and keep that cat comfortable and keep it from needing to have recurrent needles poked into the chest. So that was a really good case for it. And I wanted to show you guys kind of a little bit about how that works. Um, so I, I had my technician knowing that I was going to do this lecture. <laughs> I actually wanted to catch a video of, of putting one of these in and show you a little bit about it. So the great thing about this is you don't have to anesthetize these patients. I do all of these with sedation, all right? Sedation in a local lidocaine block, even in cats. That works really well. In this particular case, I ended up using, um, I'll use, depending on how sick or unsick the dog or cat is, I'll either use some acepromazine butorphanol in a local block, or I'll use dexbutorphanol in, in a local block as well. Either way, the actual procedure takes about two or three minutes. It's not very long at all. So I just need them to be really still and really let me get to what I need to do, and then I can reverse them and wake them up right after that. So it works really well. This is actually, um, um, a video of me identifying my fluid pocket with the ultrasound probe as to where I'm actually going to go into that cat's chest while my technician is shaving the entire cat. Um, and whenever I find, I don't know if you guys do this, I, I like to do this little trick where when I find on the ultrasound where I'm going to go into the chest, I use the back, the, the hub of the needle, and I depress it into the skin and twist it a little bit. That way I can then scrub over it and I still keep 
like that identifies my hole where I'm going to go. That way when I scrub, I don't lose track of where I'm supposed to actually enter the chest. So I like to do that as a little trick, and especially when I'm gonna place a chest tube, make a stab incision and things like that, I like to really identify that um, location really well. So basically, I'm looking with the ultrasound probe, I find the best pocket with the largest amount of fluid. I'm gonna look somewhere around the eighth to ninth intercostal space, and I'm gonna aim dorsally for my entry and I'm gonna go towards the opposite elbow for my um, ultimate direction. That's my general anatomic uh, feeling for where this tube is gonna go. And then I'll show you a video of kind of how that, how that goes. So I'm sorry about the close-up of me. That's not intentional. Um, so what I'm, what I'm doing here is I've actually got the uh, 18, it's an 18 gauge regular IV catheter which goes into the left side of this cat's thorax right there. You're gonna go all the way through until you pop into the chest. I've got my entire kit opened right there. You remove the stylet once you're well inside of the chest. Don't forget you've got at least three or four good centimeters of a fluid pocket before you're gonna hit any kind of really important structure like the heart or the lungs. This is another reason you don't want to tap the chest dry and then try to put in a chest tube or a drainage catheter. You actually want to put them in with as much fluid as you can possibly left inside the chest because it gives you that buffer zone that you can actually have a safety with, if that makes sense. So I confirm that I'm in the chest. I've got Kyle coming back through the tube right there, through the catheter. I take the syringe out once I've confirmed placement, and then I'm taking my J wire, which is a very soft-tipped type of guide wire and I'm going to insert that into the catheter, into the 18 gauge catheter that's in the chest. And in between, every time I take something off of that catheter, I put my finger over it so I don't get air inside of the chest that way. I tend to feed about 10 or 15 centimeters of this guide wire inside of the catheter, and that guide wire is now entering the chest. And that's the guide wire that's gonna guide my ultimate drainage catheter into its final location. Kind of have to be a little bit crafty with your hands. There's a lot to do. This is me almost making a rookie mistake, but I wanted to include that because this is something that you will do at some point, and, and it's okay because I almost did it right here. So I almost went ahead and started to place the drainage catheter over the guide wire without removing my IV catheter that's in the chest, right? So that's not gonna work. But then I realized that, and then I removed my catheter from the chest. Question. Yes, sir. I'm gonna... like 15 centimeters of wire up I've got about probably 10 centimeters of wire inside the cat. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and the wire, when you look at it closely, every 10 centimeters has a marker. So you kind of have an idea of how far in you are. You don't need that much to be inside there. Inside. It can, it can. Okay. It's, um, it's, it, it's got a J tip, um, and that's actually a safety feature. So it's not a straight tip. It doesn't go into a lung or the heart or a major vessel. It's a J tip, so it will bounce off everything that it hits. So good question, yep, in case you go too far. One important thing to remember is never lose hold of the guide wire, all right? So I've pulled off my catheter and now I'm actually going to feed the final drainage catheter over the guide wire and into the chest. Again, this is all done just under sedation. The cat has got some butorphanol and dexmedetomidine. It's being really compliant with us. Lidocaine gets you a long way because it really does desensitize them. Never lose track of the guide wire. Feed the guide wire through that entire mile low profile tube. It comes out the other end, and then you just follow the guide wire as you feed that over into the chest, and it's going to follow the path that you've made for it. And how much do you need to put in? Well, for one thing, every fenestration on that tube has to be inside of the chest, right? That makes sense. You wouldn't be able to work with this functionally if half the holes are outside the chest and the other half are inside of the chest. So half, everything has to be inside of the chest. Close it off and then uh, pull out your guide wire and all you have left is tube inside of the thorax and uh, 
a lower lock at the end of it. So I won't, I won't go through a lot of the details here. Essentially, that lower lock is going to get a, some kind of attachment to it. You're going to confirm uh, placement with another syringe. I just like to always make sure that I'm still where I think I am, right? Um, so there I am getting Kyle right back, which is great. Close that off. And then once it is all secure and in the right place, I will go ahead and suture that tube directly to the skin with those little adapters that come right in the kit in three places, one, two, three, and then a little bit of a Chinese finger trap. And then that is kind of your final situation. At the end, the cat got two tubes, one on each side, um, and uh, had the Kyle drained bilaterally that way with just minimal sedation. And those tubes stay in place for three, four, five days as long as you need them. So I strongly recommend these for um, chest drainage, but if you're using or needing things for bladder drainage, um, then absolutely you can use those pigtail catheters as well. Gallbladder drainage, don't do that sort of routinely. Um, that was a very specific case. This is not something I do commonly. It had to be done for one particular case, but I did get to use these tubes as well for that. Um, and I think that they're, they're really great to use. So this is a cat that was spared anesthesia and was spared chest tubes and trauma to the chest by having this in place. And they're really easy to remove. When you're done using them, you just cut the sutures, pull them out. You might be able to staple that hole if you need to. If you don't need to, you don't have to do anything. So that's it. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Good question. You, you can do the tunneling, but you don't have to. You don't have to. Uh, the way that you have to with the chest tubes because you're trying to make more of a seal. The, the hole, the entry hole, this is a, I used a 14 gauge, 14 or 16 gauge. So it's essentially a little bigger than an IV catheter. Um, so you can tunnel if you want, but honestly that will seal right over in, a, in just a few minutes at the end. For pyothorax, I would use, I would try it. And, and I find that they do work because they're fenestrated so many, there's like eight centimeters of fenestration. Um, I think it's worth trying. I think if it's like a German Shepherd or a really big dog, I think you might still have to use the big tubes, but I would at least try this and see how it goes. Yeah, with, I would use the biggest one I could find though. Yes, good question, sir. The biggest patient? Oh goodness, you mean like, are you saying that they're too small for some of the bigger ones? Yeah, I, for, for a, an effusion that is not very viscous or, or uh, flocculent, I've done it in 20, 30 kilogram dogs easily. Depends on how fast you need, right? Because the size of the catheter also determines how much you can get out of it. So if it was like a tension pneumothorax in a giant breed dog, this may not be fast enough. It's a good question. Yes, sir. Yeah, great question. I, I will definitely put lidocaine or bupivacaine at the entry at the time. And then we do have every six or 12 hours bupivacaine flushes inside of the tube. And I hope that it goes through all the fenestration and desensitizes the pleural space. My understanding though, is that it's the, um, it's the entry that hurts even more, like the muscle and the rib is actually where it hurts even more than the pleural space. So sometimes I will rib block them as well. So I will do like a rib block if I'm present in the building every 12 hours, um, but I'll have my technicians also do like a bupivacaine flush every six hours or so. Good question. Thank you, guys. I'm happy to take any more questions some extra questions, questions. I'm sure she'd be happy to answer them down here in the last minute or two. Let's give her one more round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you.